Hello, my name is Sharon Bruni. I am the Associate Director for Public Services at the Mount Lebanon Public Library. Shortly after I started working at the library, I was walking by our larger event room and noticed that the room was full to capacity, with attendees pouring out into the library. What struck me most was that the attendees were mostly young adults. Unfortunately, we don't generally have programs at the library that are attended by so many young people at one time. I found out that the program was Pete DiNardo's presentation on the display of the Confederate flag and its role in the meaning of America. What I saw and heard in addition to the crowd was a room of people fully engaged in listening and discussion. Since that time, I've had the occasion to partner with Pete on other programs. I've noticed that these programs usually include opportunities for people to listen to firsthand experiences, have ample time for question and answers, as well as discussion. It is important for us to recognize that history can be subjective, that is comprised of varying perspectives. It is both deep and complex, and, and most oftentimes the commonly understood narrative is bereft of these complexities. These narratives have been distilled in such a way that the various actors in the immediacy and passion of the social actions of masses of people that were integral to the historic movements have been lost, forgotten, and made tepid to future generations. At best, they are dispassionate. At worst, they are vulnerable to revisionism. This past Sunday, the library, in collaboration with the Mount Lebanon Historical Society and Classrooms Without Borders, hosted a talk by the Polish author Anna Bikant. Anna spoke about the recently approved Polish Senate bill to criminalize any speech that suggests Poland had a complicit role in the Holocaust. Anna mentioned that her largest concern was that young historians will no longer study the relationship between Poland and the Holocaust. The past will cease to be actively and critically engaged and succumb to a revised national narrative. The Civil Rights Movement is a seminal historic event that has, the impact and that has impact and implications on all Americans. We need to understand its complexity, and we need to be able to take the understanding, this understanding and use it for passionate civic engagement in the world we live in today. We need to use its example of how all citizens have the ability to take action against injustice, and that these actions can lead to historical change. I am, I am so honored to be a librarian in a community where teachers like Pete DiNardo provide opportunities for citizens of all ages to explore the complexity of history, of history and provide for us inspiration from the past to take action in our lives today. I am honored to work in a community where a school district supports its students to actively participate in expressing their rights as American citizens and protesting injustice in their lives. To quote Howard Zinn, author of A People's History, teachers must also address the problem that people have been miseducated to become dependent on government, to think that their supreme act as citizens is to go to the polls and vote every two years or four years. That's where the history of social movements come in. Teachers should dwell on Shea's rebellion, on colonial rebellions, on the abolitionist movement, on the populist movement, on the labor movement, and so on and on and make sure that these social movements don't get lost in the overall story of presidents and congresses and supreme courts. Emphasizing social and protest movements in the making of history gives students a feeling that they, as citizens, are the most important actors in its history. Pete is one such teacher. It is my honor this evening to introduce Pete DiNardo, who will, whose talk tonight will enlighten us on the undertaught history of the role of women in the civil rights movement. Well, Sharon, thank you very much for that incredibly kind and incredibly thoughtful introduction. Um, I, I was at that Sunday evening talk, and it was fabulous. And then to let you know about this sort of bouillabaisse of cooperative activity going on, we had Ms. Picant come into the school the other day and talk with kids directly. With the Historical Society, the library and I will be also supporting, as a little advertisement, First Ladies of Western Pennsylvania, which will be happening next Thursday at 7 p.m. Also, I might add, I am a dues-paying member of the Mount Levin Historical Society, which Jim Wojcik Wo Wo would like me to say. Uh, and if you'd like more information on that, there's some pamphlets outside. 
Folks, last month I begged your forgiveness as I somewhat deified Medgar Evers. I need to beg your forgiveness again tonight. My whole career, I have integrated women's history and to a lesser extent, gender studies into my teaching. Tonight's topic was, like the others, not new to me. But, ask my wife, I have a problem. Or she might say multiple problems. Part of that is a type A personality that isn't satisfied with good enough. So I ended up researching more than what I already knew, and I got deeper into it. This particular talk has been the most exhilarating to prepare for, the most exhausting, and the most educative, and also the most nerve-wracking, as I am anxious about how it will go. In one evening, though, I am unable to give full honor to these amazing women that inspire me, and that is what I ask you forgiveness for. But I hope that in my inability to give them full justice, I will inspire you to look further into their lives. Tonight, I'm going to start with a couple iconic moments. Then I'm going to categorize these women as godmothers, mothers, and daughters of the movement. Speaking of images, what would be the single most iconic moment of the civil rights movement? I can wait. I can't. I heard someone. Of course. August 28, 1963, it's the date I will test you on at the end. The Great March on Washington. It's, it's properly remembered for this moment. But if we look closely, and I'm going to walk over here, this is the program that I tried to enlarge enough. Number five on the list, many don't know that Dr. King was the 10th speaker. There were other great people who spoke, but they were great men. Number five says, tribute to Negro women fighters for freedom to be delivered by Mrs. Medgar Evers, Merle Evers. She actually couldn't make it to the march because she had double booked that day. But this idea of a tribute is powerful because these wonderful women were asked to simply stand and be recognized as muted symbols. But on the great walk to the march, the men walked down Constitution Avenue. You can see those beautiful leaders there. Those women who were given a tribute were asked to walk down Independence Avenue with the wives of the men. No woman was allowed to go to the White House with these men to meet with President Kennedy. In fact, up until a few weeks before the march, there would be no tribute to women. It was demanded by women. That tribute to women, Fighters for Freedom, was read by Daisy Bates. This is the, the Kennedy uh, uh, greeting there. And here's what it was. The women of this country, Mr. Randolph, pledged to you, to Martin Luther King, Roy Wilkins, and all of you fighting for civil liberties, that we will join hands with you as women of this country. We will kneel in, we will sit in, until we can eat in any counter in the United States. We will walk until we are free, until we can walk to any school. And we will sit in, and we will kneel in, and we will line in, if necessary, until every Negro in America can vote. This we pledge to the women of America. A fine pledge indeed, but it begins a pledge to men, and it was written by a man. Taking over the role that Daisy Bates was to have, that read of reading the names, was the beautiful A. Philip Randolph. And a moment that was absolutely inconsistent with his eloquence, he fumbled the entire tribute. He stumbled on the words, wasn't aware who would come next until somebody reminded him that woman named Rosa Parks. One of the women standing on that stage recounted how they sort of all grinned, quote, as we recognized anew that Negro women are second class citizens in the same way that white women are in our culture. And despite the request that the women not stay for another moment in DC, nope. Immediately following it, the National Council of Negro Women, led by Dorothy Height, scheduled a debriefing for Washington the following day. It was called, After the March, What? And it began a conversation of women's place both in that great day and the entire movement. In fact, a follow-up meeting in November of that year had Polly Murray speaking about, quote, the bitterly humiliating experience that token representation at the march gave them. And sadly, we all probably know that token representation was true for women of most of recorded history, 
up until the last few decades. But even with a better grasp of women's roles in our past and present, memories are clouded. With that, let's examine the next iconic image. Without doubt, this has to be number two, Miss Rosa Parks. I once read that, quote, Rosa Parks is too often trapped on the bus, which to me is a fundamental problem of both how we remember history and how we rob people of their agency. Jeannie Theoris, author of The Rebellious Life of Rosa Parks, wrote that, quote, when she died in 2005, the word quiet was used in most of her obituaries and eulogies. We have grown comfortable with Rosa Parks, who is often seen but rarely heard. And look at the two classic images, her booking, and then an image that was, uh, um, happened after the arrest. It was staged. Nothing about her life really is seen there other than a candid shot here. In fact, in a commentary right after her death in 2005, the New York Times described her, quote, as the accidental matriarch of the civil rights movement. Accidental. Thin praise at best. In 2002, the film Barbershop had Cedric the Entertainer taking on what he called the major lie of the civil rights movement. That is the heroism of Rosa Parks. Now, I can't play you the clip because there's a lot of language in it that we can't play in school. <laughs> what she done sure ain't special. And he followed it up. It's a whole lot of black folks that did this. Shocking and challenged by the other folks in the barbershop as insulting and wrong, Cedric had a point. Rosa Parks' early life to her later life gives evidence to what she described as a life history of being rebellious. And in this, she often cites her grandfather. She remembered as a little girl in rural Alabama, sitting up at night with him, watching as he held a shotgun, fending off the Ku Klux Klan. And she later wrote that she said, I wanted to see him kill a Ku Kluxer. That rebellious spirit happened when she was a young child. A white boy pushed her off a sidewalk because she was walking in a white neighborhood. She pushed back. In her early years of marriage, she assisted her husband, who worked with the NAACP investigating the, fallacious, the false charges against the Scottsboro Boys. She then became secretary for E.D. Nixon, who was in charge of the local NAACP in Montgomery. And in 1943, she went to register to vote twice and was rejected each time. The first time, she was told that she was illiterate. The second time, they didn't give a reason at all. In 1945, she actually did achieve that right to vote. And throughout her life, she recalled there were many, many kind white people. Some of them influenced her life. But they didn't outweigh the number of white people that were condescending. And they certainly didn't outweigh the systematic limits of Jim Crow. In 1943, Rosa Parks elevated her rebelliousness when she was kicked off a bus. The system in the Montgomery uh, city was the 10-16-10 system. The first 10 seats were strictly reserved for white folks. The back 10 were strictly reserved for black folks. The middle 16, sort of like an accordion, what some called the floating line. If you were black, you had to pay here, and you were required to exit and enter the back door. Rosa Parks, at least twice in her life, had a bus drive off, as was common for many a driver. Some drivers carried weapons. Some were nice. Many were viciously racist. So on this day in 1943, Rosa Parks entered the front door and proceeded to walk to the neutral middle section. So what's she doing wrong? Walking through the white section. James Blake, the driver, yells at her, goes to grab her to throw her off the bus. And Rosa Parks, in an eloquent way, drops her purse and, like a lady, picks it up as she sits in the front row. She looks him square in the eye and says, I will get off this bus, but you will not touch me. And she made a personal vow that she would never give him another dime again, never ride his bus again. In 1946, this wonderful woman met Ella Baker, who I will discuss later. 
By the late 40s, she was organizing youth in Montgomery, the NAACP Youth Council. She met Virginia and Clifford Dorr, two wonderful white folks who introduced her to the Highlander Folk School. If you haven't heard of the Highlander Folk School, it was started in Tennessee in 1932, became the centerpiece of labor organizing. It was where the song with Pete Seeger's help, We Shall Overcome, went from a spiritual to a movement anthem. At Highlander, they taught these radical things like literacy, self-advocacy, and events that would make us real. In 2007, a former student of mine in a push, Jamie Blair, came to my evening presentation about the Montgomery movement, and in a five-minute discussion of, of Highlander, was inspired to spend the next four months researching it. Last fall, I had the fortune and need to talk to Jamie. She's in Philadelphia now. We spent about an hour on the phone, and we recalled this moment. It was a seedbed for her to then work with Mexican squatters, the Immokalee farm workers in Florida, and now battered women and women in need uh, of education in Philadelphia. It is amazing, really, how many things can percolate from one moment. In the 50s and 60s, you had this sense that uh, uh, Highlander was educating people for a movement. In fact, in August of 1955, Rosa Parks went for two weeks to the Highlander Folk School. This is an image from actually 1957. Can anybody recognize who's there? On the far left is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On the far right is Reverend Ralph Abernathy. And behind them, Pete Seeger with Rosa Parks. Occurs after Montgomery, though. Eldridge Cleaver, El Eldridge Cleaver would describe what happened a few months after her going to Highlander uh, thus. Somewhere in the universe, a gear in the machinery shifted. But Cedric the barber still had a point. Rosa Parks was exceptional, he's wrong on that. But there were a whole lot of ladies who came before Rosa. Among them, I list a few here. I'd like to give them some justice. Not enough, but some. The name in the middle I'll come to again, Joanne Robinson, professor at Alabama State College, distracted by her holiday shopping in 1949, and mistakenly took a seat too far forward in the first 10. There were two passengers on the bus. One gentleman, an incredibly angry and vile white man, yelled, you got to get out of there, you have to get out of there, and raised his hand to her to strike her. She was so frightened, so fearful, she ran from the bus. She discovered, though, in researching this, how common her terror was. And in her analysis, three out of every five Af African Americans experienced some form of verbal or physical brutality by a driver or a passenger every year. More women than men were thrown off buses. She was interested in that, and more women challenged because they were less vulnerable. On this list here, Viola White, 1945, was taken off and beaten on the bus. Geneva Johnson, also in 45, was kicked off the bus for allegedly talking back. In 1953 alone, there were at least 30 African Amer mostly women, African Americans, who were thrown off buses. So Cedric does have a point. If we go to the year that Rosa did decide finally to sit again, March the 2nd, Claudette Colvin. Raise your hand if you've heard the name. Claudette Colvin was 15 years old on, and on March the 2nd stayed seated. She had been recruited by the NAACP Youth Council, that is by Rosa Parks. Very poor family. She stayed with Rosa Parks overnight a number of times when they were involved in active learning. She had learned a bit in high school, and she simply believed that she had the right to sit where she wanted to sit. A beginning movement that then receded. Edie Nixon would spread a word. The reason was because she was pregnant, and the black religious community would not get behind a 15-year-old unmarried pregnant girl. She rejected that argument. She did become pregnant. In depression from being rejected, she was abused by an older man, but that was months after this incident. No, later in her life, she's confident. The reason that she didn't become the face of the movement 
In her words, they didn't want me because I didn't represent the middle class. She was poor. Far side, Aurelia Broder, April 29th, seven months before Rosa Parks. This woman, who bore 21 children, five sets of twins, two sets of triplets, completed high school in, in her 30s, tough lady, was thrown off the bus. She wasn't selected because they didn't believe she could hand, handle the cross-examination well. Well, at her trial, the prosecutor was attempting to ask her, why would you do this? Well, her simple answer, I had stopped riding because I wanted better treatment. Nope, it was Martin Luther King who put you up to this. No, it's the segregation laws of Alabama that caused it. He did not put it into us. And finally, six weeks before Rosa Parks, the last name who I cannot find a picture of, Mary Louise Smith was arrested. She was a maid who earned $2 a day and her white employer stiffed her of $11. Poor woman with no cash, sobbing and crying and desperate on that bus ride home, just simply didn't want to move when told to move on back. As she said, I told him, I got the privilege to sit here like anybody else. Sadly, she, like Colvin, likely had the problem of being poor. Word was that her father was a drunkard. To the end of her life, she rejected that claim. So Cedric has a point that there were women before, but there's no doubt that December the 1st, 1955, the cog shifts. So a similar bus with a showing of where Rosa Parks sat. She sat in the first row of the neutral section. So when kids tell me that she sat in the front row of the bus, not accurate. She sat in the front row of the legal section for her of the bus. What happened was this. It was five o'clock on December the 1st. She had finished her day and she went to wait where her normal bus would come. After about an hour of waiting, she surmised that she either missed it or was late for it. So she walked about a block and a half away to an alternative bus. Around six o'clock, boarded that bus. Midway through the ride, the bus had filled. At that point, that fluid line would move back. She was told, move on back. And that sound echoed in her mind because in her tiredness and haste, it was James Blake, the very driver that she had pledged to never, ever ride his bus again. She said in those 10 seconds, so many thoughts went through her mind. Her grandfather's commentary about the white abolitionist John Brown and his comments that talk, 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 what we need is action. In her mind went the brutal murder of Emmett Till just four months earlier. And in her mind went the idea that she had been pushed as far as she could be pushed. So she refused to move. And Blake told her, well, I'm going to have to arrest you. And Rosa Parks replied, you may do that. And in that, she takes the position of power, allowing him to do what he will do. When the police arrived, she asked them, why do you push us around dealing with bigger systemic issues? And one officer says, I don't know, but the law is the law and you're under arrest. Some people had left, but others stayed because they knew this iconic woman was there. Rosa had doubts. She was the prime breadwinner in her family. Her mother was ill, but she stayed seated because she was tired of being pushed around. While Rosa was in jail, a movement happened. So we asked the question, why Rosa and not the others? Well, historian David Garrow, I think, nails it. Just look at that picture. It's both that she's known to be a committed civic activist, he wrote, and that she's known to be a lady. And you can see it in the photos. She's got gravitas. She encompasses a clear sense of quiet spiritual growth. And the timing was right. E.D. Nixon wrote, when Rosa Parks was arrested, I thought, this is it. She's morally clean. She's reliable. Nobody had nothing on her. She had the courage of her convictions. But moments need organization to become movements. And for that, we return to jo Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson and the Women's Political Council 
Robinson was the valedictorian of her high school and the only member of her family to go to college. The Women's Political Council of Montgomery, formed in 1946, made mostly of middle-class women, designed to elevate the race and improve their status as a group. In 1950, this woman became the president of the council. In 1953, the council, led by her, lobbied the city commissioners to have better treatment of black folks in unfair practice across the board. They were consistently ignored. In 1954, right after the Brown v. Board decision, Robinson wrote the mayor demanding that bus drivers stop humiliating and insulting black passengers, again ignored. Years later, while writing her memoir, she poured through her records of the night of December 1st when Rosa was arrested, and she found a, st a statement she had written, right? The Women's Political Council will not wait for Mrs. Park's consent to call for a boycott of city buses. They had been planning this. And she designed the flyers that you see to the left. And during that process of designing them, she had a flyer ready to go by midnight. She called a colleague at Alabama State who allowed her and two of her students to get into an office and use this old thing that some of us remember called a mimeograph machine and they produced by 4 a.m., less than 10 hours after the arrest of Rosa Parks, 35,000 flyers. Had a meeting with about 50 people planning a one-day boycott, December the 5th, 1955. The goal was 60% participation. The result was 100%, nearly. Martin Luther King said of Mrs. Uh, Joanne, Miss Joanne Robinson, more than any other person, she was active on every level of the protest. After that great day of success came the mass meeting of December the 5th, the one that you may know of. 5,000 people in and around the church and Dr. King so eloquent, so moving, so convincing. But there were many of Rosa Parks' students there and Mary Frances, one of them, I love her line. Ah, oh, she's so sweet, they messed with the wrong one now. Rosa Parks wanted to speak, but the male leader said, you've done enough. As you know, 381 days later, the Supreme Court overturned the segregation laws of Montgomery buses. A great victory for the Civil Rights Movement. But for Rosa Parks, that year was almost terrible, particularly the male chauvinism. Baptist ministers that she respected would mock her as she entered the room. Well, if it isn't the superstar. Ralph Abernathy, co-founder of the SCLC, would have uh, described her to Daisy Bates as, quote, um, a tool of the movement. E.D. Nixon described her as a lovely, stupid woman. But women, too, isolated her. Aurelia Browder, Claudette Colvin, especially Claudette Colvin, had a bit of jealousy. Rosa this, Rosa that. They were angry. Rosa Parks and her husband both lost their jobs. And with the isolation from the Montgomery community, they moved to Detroit. Ralph Abernathy apologized. Edie Nixon said, I didn't realize how much she meant to us and the movement. The Southern Con uh, Christian Leadership Conference, the SELC, King's Organization, gave her an honorary membership. But at every conference and at every meeting, they did not allow her to have direct involvement in discussion and say on what would happen. Her move to the North was not placid. As she said, freedom fighters never retire. Time is running out for a peaceful solution. It may even be too late to save our society from total destruction. I don't believe in gradualism or that whatever should be done for the better should take forever to do. By 1965, she worked in the office of John Conyers. From the 70s on, she pressed for change in the criminal justice system. We could use her today. School and housing inequality, jobs and welfare policy. For a time, she adhered to black power. At one point, she said that her personal hero was Malcolm X. 
They met on a few occasions, initiated by him, who wanted to meet this powerful woman. According to the Pittsburgh Courier, Parks was part of a militant group of blacks who attended the 1968 Democratic Convention, opting not to endorse any of those candidates. She spoke at a solidarity rally of the Poor People's Movement. She attended militant conferences in 68, 72, and beyond. She visited a Black Panther Party school because they were putting on a play written in her honor. She served on the board of Planned Parenthood. In foreign policy, she was part of a variety of groups calling for the end of war in Vietnam. Here you see her at the age of 71 protesting apartheid in South Africa. She spoke out against Clarence Thomas's nomination to the Supreme Court dismayed by his poor record on civil rights. Then sometime in the 1990s, and there's an archival uh, page of this, on a paper bag she scribbled these words. Though she died in 2005, she is linked to today. In January, Oprah Winf Winfrey made mention of Rosa Parks and the case of Recy Taylor. In large part because Taylor had died in December of 2017 and because of the Me Too movement. On September the 3rd, 1944, Recy Taylor was walking home from church when six white men grabbed her, shoved her into a car, drove her to uh, a pine grove blindfolded her, and the six men proceeded to strip her and rape her. She identified the car, and the sheriff knew who had done it, but had done nothing. The NAACP sent Miss Rosa Parks to investigate. And while she was interviewing Recy Taylor, the sheriff would drive by that house. He stormed in and told uh, Parks to get out. We do not want any agitators here. Rosa Parks, nervous about his conduct, went back to Montgomery, where she proceeded to launch the Alabama Committee for Equal Justice for Mrs. Recy Taylor and flooded the South with flyers, decrying the white attacks on black women. Sadly, October of that year, a grand jury refused to indict the men. So Parks wrote the governor, I know that you will not fail to let the people of Alabama know that there is equal justice for all our citizens but no justice was done. In 2011, Alabama issued a formal apology for their repugnant behavior during this time. Parks was involved in numerous other cases of rape and assault. Gertrude Perkins, March of 1949, was raped at gunpoint by two white police officers. Parks helped lead a two-month campaign to investigate the assault. Flossie Hardman, February of 1951, raped by Sam Green, who employed her as a babysitter and owned a grocery store. An all-white jury took five minutes to acquit him. The NAACP, Parks, and the Women's Political Council launched a boycott to great effect of Green's store. She was committed to women's rights throughout her life, and in 1974, uh, rather, helped in Joan Little's case. That's Reese Taylor, sorry. This is Joan Little. Little was a 20-year-old black woman serving a seven-year sentence for robbery. She killed a white guard who sexually assaulted her. Parks co-founded the Joan Little Defense Committee. Little was acquitted, becoming the first woman in U.S. history to successfully use self-defense against sexual assault in a homicide case. Beyond these cases, uh, I do believe there was a personal zeal, personal element in her zeal. When Rosa Parks was younger, a uh, white worker in the house that she was employed came in drunk and attempted to sexually assault her. She resisted in her memoir. I was ready and willing to die, but give any consent? Never, never, never. If he wanted to kill me and rape a dead body, he was welcome, but he would have to kill me first. So Cedric, you're right. But for the rest of us, let Rosa off the bus. So now I'd like to look at the godmothers of the movement. And I've got a pop quiz. Identify, number one, I see many of you taking notes. You have to write the answers down before I give them. Who is best known interchangeably as the queen mother or godmother of the civil rights movement? Who did the crisis, which is the magazine of the NAACP, called the godmother of the student movement? 
And who was the African-American woman credited with the legal argument for the Equal Pay Act and with co-founding the National Organization of Women? Tick-tock, 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 tick-tock. Jim? Who has all three? All right, Nia. Ella Baker, very good. Here's a photographic help. Ella Baker is in the middle. Can anybody name the other two? I can't, no, that'll come later. She'll come later. Septa McClark on the left and Polly Murray on the right. So I'd like to share with you some stories about these three women. Septa McClark was definitely often called Queen Mother and the Mother of the Movement. She attended public schools in Charleston, Jim. Named after her now, right. So she be began working, and very interestingly, she wanted to attend a private school there that when my wife and I were in Charleston for our 25th anniversary, we visited because we were tired of the sort of whites-only public tour that we got walking around the city called the Avery Institute. She trained to become a teacher, but she couldn't teach in Charleston because Charleston prohibited blacks from teaching at all in Charleston. So she taught outside of Charleston for a while, but yearned to come back to her hometown. So she joined the NAACP and came back inspired. And she lobbied and lobbied and surveyed, went door to door, knocking door to door, got two thirds of black Charlestonians uh, to, to pledge a desire to have black adults teach black children, and they won. Took a year, but they won. She spent the next 20 years then demanding that black teachers get equal pay to white teachers, and they won. Septa McClark could have settled into that life as an elementary teacher, but she was that activist. And in 1957, she got fired for being that activist because South Carolina decided that if you were a public employee, you could not be a member of a civil rights organization. And the NAACP is surely a civil rights organization. So she was fired at nearly 60 years of age. But she really, her teaching was her vocation, but her calling would be her activism. So a few years before she was fired, she found a small school in Tennessee. If you were paying attention earlier, you know the name of it. What was the name? Highlander School. And she attended the Highlander School, where she learned about the civics literacy, math literacy, and she started to become that teacher of adults and making them literate. And while she was there, she had a young mentee, Miss Rosa Parks. Septa McClark and Rosa Parks became peas in a pod here. After a bogus arrest, Clarks left Tennessee and moved back to Georgia to start, or moved to Georgia to start citizenship schools. Those were taken up by King and the SCLC, and she ended up creating 800 citizenship schools to educate people who had for decades been ignored. Clark wrote in 1965 that the greatest evil in our country today is not racism, but ignorance. Knowledge could empower marginalized groups in ways that formal legal equality couldn't. As Mia knew, the next one, my favorite, is Miss Ella Baker. Now, my colleagues whom I love and who each surpasses me in skill and decorum in so many ways give me a ton of grief when I argue, especially at this time when we're discussing the civil rights movement, for the central place of Ella Baker in examining the movement. I had three wonderful APUSH students in the past, Julia Gittleman, Yasmina Salib, and one Grace Schmidt, uh, who were moved by this story and studied her life. Legendary activist and campaigner for children, Eleanor Holmes Morton, uh, Norton, sorry, once said of Ella Baker, I don't know how many people know her name, but thousands know her work. She has been at the cutting edge of initiating actions that led to great changes in this country, and she never stayed to gather the glory. Now, I wanted to ask earlier, can I just see a show of hands? Before tonight, how many heard the name Ella Baker? Okay, keep them up. How many could have written more than three sentences about her? Septa McClark, Polly Murray, part of our problems. Dr. King, Dr. King, if Ella had been born a man, God only knows what she would have been able to do. She had the fortune of being born to a fortunate family. They owned their own land. She was never hungry. Her mother insisted that her children were able to read before they went to school. Her fortune continued that her mother made sure she was a confident woman, a good public speaker. Her high school was exceptionally rare. 
She had international speakers coming in. She learned about the world, and she learned about political theory and political discussions. She used her fortune, though, in the service of others. She was valedictorian of both her high school and college. And in high school, she responded to demands of students. The students wanted what today might not be considered such a radical thing, but for them was deeply important. These girls wanted the right to wear stockings. And so she went to the administration to fight for this right. In her college valedictorian speech, she called for the youth of our nation to accept the noble challenge in front of them. We will strike against evil, strife, and war until the echo shall resound in the recesses of the earth. To my high school friends and peeps who are here, please understand that your life of activism can begin at your age. In the 20s, she experienced the Harlem Renaissance and met great people, Polly Murray, A. Philip Randolph. They encouraged her to look at beyond race, look at gender and class inequality. In the 30s, she helped run a food cooperative in Harlem. In 1941, she, like the other women, was thrown off, not a bus, but a train. She was in the dining car, and a military policeman came over to her and physically removed her, and in this resounding, beautiful voice, you are overstepping your bounds. And she herself led her out of that area. After that, she was hired by the NAACP as a field secretary, and she spent five months out of, it, out of every year in the South, where she put her life on the line, employing her most powerful idea, self-empowerment. People, she thought, had the ability to both define and find solutions to their problems. What she said, I think, epitomizes her life. You didn't say to people, look here, this is what to do. You listened. Every one of those people knew what they needed. Years later, one of her mentees, a gentleman who worked for Mayor Marion Barry of DC, said, what she taught was that struggle was a continuing activity, that everyone had a purpose. She would make you think through what you were about to do, let you decide your tactics, then educated you to history. She would never say anything was impossible, but she would gird you for disappointment. When events in Montgomery started to percolate, Ella Baker formed a northern group called In Friendship to enable northerners who had a conscience to help this movement, provide money for bail, money for relief if you can't get the jobs, etc. She went back and forth between the North and Montgomery a lot, but she was getting frustrated with Dr. King and the leadership of the movement. What she felt was that there was lack of organizing and planning. And when the success of the boycott was won, she responded to the lack of a plan for afterwards thus. It was a complete letdown. Nothing was happening. And with colleagues Baird Rustin and Stanley Levinson, she began work on a new Southern-based movement. In concert with King, that became the SCLC. That movement that was born out of great female activism would place King as the head, Ralph Nathy as the second assistant. But no woman from the Montgomery bus boycott was allowed to be on the board. And despite her crucial role, Ella Baker was also ignored. On being ignored, Baker said, it was not something that would go over with a male-dominated leadership. My personality was not right. I was not afraid to disagree with the higher authorities. I suppose today somebody would say she persisted. For its first program, the SCLC, featured here, uh, began what was called the Crusade for Citizenship. The idea was a voter registration drive. It was supposed to start in February of 1958. A little over a month before it was to begin, a, um, Bayard Rustin noticed, boy, nothing's been done. And told King, you got to hire Ella Baker as executive director of SCLC. King thought, he said, nope, I'll make her acting director. So Baker took that insult and spent four weeks organizing. She was generously allowed to use the mimeograph machine at King's Church after 5 p.m. When February the 12th arrived, she had those 22 cities ready to roll. And as she said, it all depended on churches and women, not men. Men didn't do the things that had to be done. 
Baker would take this radically democratic tenant advocating for what she said was a group-centered leadership rather than a leadership-centered group and called for radical change by addressing root causes. Her most biting commentary about Dr. King was, the movement made Martin. Martin did not make the movement. And that would find evidence in the next cause she endorsed. Responding to the courageous efforts of young people to sit in, Baker used her status in the SCLC to get a conference hosted at her alma mater, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, for over Easter weekend of 1960. 300 students from 58 colleges attended. And after a deep, long night of discussion and debate uh, with these young radicals, Ella Baker spoke to them and gave a speech that has become known as bigger than a hamburger. Properly nurtured, she argued, young people had all the power they needed. She summarized her speech in an article she wrote the next month. The curtain sit-ins and other demonstrations are concerned with something bigger than a hamburger or even a giant-sized Coke. Negro students and white students, North and South, are seeking to rid America of the scourge of racial segregation and discrimination, not only at lunch counters, but in every aspect of life. Repeatedly, it was emphasized that the movement was concerned with the moral implications of racial discrimination of the, for the whole world and the human race. What I'd like you to focus on it was further evident that desire for supportive cooperation from adult leaders and the adult community was also temp tempered by apprehension that adults might try to capture the student movement. She warned them, you join the SCLC, it's tempting. It's a big name, big leader. They will control you. So they stayed separate in the, in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I will say this, just as King undervalued Ella Baker, Baker never truly, fully appreciated King's strengths. His ability to inspire poor as well as rich, his deep generosity, his ability to grow, and his willingness to suffer. But if you ask the students, if you ask the youth, these folks would say something else. Upper left, James Foreman, later Executive Secretary of SNCC, said without Baker, there would be no story of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Congressman John Lewis, in the upper center. Baker, quote, was our personal Gandhi, the spiritual leader of SNCC. Stokely Carmichael to the far right. The most powerful person in the struggle of the early 60s was Miss Ella Baker, and every, everyone called her Miss Ella Baker, not Martin Luther King. Bob Zellner, the white man at the bottom. You didn't make, she said about her, you didn't make us feel like damn fools, like ad other adults did, and you didn't try to compete with us. Ella Baker, the mother of the student movement. Our last godmother, Miss Polly Murray. Polly Murray, who actually died in Pittsburgh, but Polly Murray didn't have the fortunate life beginning that Ella Baker did. When she was three years old, her mother died. Her father, freaked out about six children under the age of 10, shipped them off to other people. He eventually, for reasons I don't know exactly why, was committed to an insane asylum. And there, a white officer racially abused him, dragged him downstairs, and beat him to death. At the age of 12, Polly Murray was put on a train to go to her father's funeral. And she looked at an open casket in which she described what she saw as his skull split open like a melon and sewed together loosely with jagged stitches, jagged stitches. Still, despite these incredibly difficult circumstances, she was a precocious child. She taught herself to read by the age of five. In high school, she was the editor-in-chief of the school newspaper, the president of the Literary Society, class secretary, a member of the debate club, top student, and forward on the basketball team, and graduated at the age of 15. Even as a child, she was conscious of the structural limitations. She refused to walk, I mean, she refused to ride streetcars, she walked everywhere. She attended no theater that required segregation. She also was arrested and thrown off a bus in 1940. In 1941, she entered a famous law school, Howard University Law School. 
On the first day, first day, her professor humiliated her when he proclaimed that he didn't know why a woman would want to go to law school. It inspired her. It drove her to become the top student. She was mistreated and scorned by her male peers, too. And two events in 1944 reveal her leadership and courage. On April 22nd, 1944, her last year in law school, scheduled to graduate in, in, in June, she found herself standing with other students outside of Thompson's Cafe, a fairly famous uh, cafe in Washington. She and fellow black students slipped inside two or three at a time and lined up in line to get food. They refused service because it did not allow blacks to have service there. They took their empty trays, nonetheless, and went and sat down. <coughs> Outside, they had colleagues with these signs. Remember, it's 1944. Some people jeered at them. Some people spat at them. Inside, Polly Murray and her allies stayed seated. By evening, sales had dropped in half, and the manager relented. The first time in 60 years that a downtown whites-only restaurant served blacks in the nation's capital. I want you to think about this. 1944, 11 years before Montgomery, 16 years before Greensboro, and a woman set the table for the movement. It was no spontaneous flyby mission. Polly Murray studied Gandhi. Afterward, Murray wrote to a dear friend, our demonstrations were thoroughly disciplined. No response was made to any taunt. We clamped down on our teeth and kept our eyes straight ahead. The friend, none other than Flotus, AKA Eleanor Roosevelt. The second event happened at law school. For 50 years since the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, black activists with white allies had advocated on the issue of separate but equal, and they emphasized the inequality in South Carolina. Black schools were given one penny for every 10 cents a white school was given, right? Get equal, separate and equal. Frustrated with the slow, slow pace of change, Polly Murray threw out a radical idea. Why not challenge the separate part? Her peers in law school mocked her. If you do that and the court takes it up, they will reject it and re-entrench Plessy. Her professor also disagreed. So this bold woman made a bet with her professor, Professor Spotswood Robinson. For 10 bucks, she said, Plessy will fall within 25 years. In her final paper in law school, Murray developed this idea further arguing that the 13th and 14th Amendments were violated by segregation laws. Some years later, Spotswood Robinson was talking with a, Spotswood Robinson was talking with a colleague, and he remembered that paper, and he pulled it out. That paper was, it was the gentleman in the middle. Spotswood Robinson turns over the paper to Thurgood Marshall, who will use that as the foundation of Brown v. the Board of Education from a law school female student. In 1948, the women's division of the Methodist Church opposed segregation, but was unsure, what do you do? Is it, what do you do in states that it's against the law for our churches to integrate versus where it's custom, right? How do you tackle each place? How do we have a national policy like that? So they asked Polly Murray to come up with an answer to that. And they expected a pamphlet. She gave them a 746 page book. Sounds like me. It's over on the left. State laws on race and color. The ACLU distributes this to law libraries, black colleges, and human rights organizations. Thurgood Marshall called this book, he kept stacks of it in the NAACP office, he called it, quote, the Bible of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Though at the top of her class at Howard, Polly Murray, unlike most black uh, students, was not allowed into Harvard they would go on for further education at Harvard. She termed that form of degradation, quote, Jane Crow, and spent much of the rest of her life working to end that. 
She argued against sex discrimination cases. She served on the Presidential Commission on Women. She challenged A. Philip Randolph to have women recognized at that great march. She helped Betty Friedan found the National Organization for Women. And then she co-wrote a law review article that interested a young lawyer at the ACLU. And we used it in this case of Reed versus Reed. The case of Reed versus Reed convinced the court, the Supreme Court in 1971, that the Equal Protection Clause applied to women. The first time the court upheld the idea that equal protection, Title VII protected classes, emphatically does apply to women. Tell me, who was that ACLU attorney? The notorious RBG. Of Polly Murray, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, we're standing on their shoulders. We're saying the same things they said, but now at last society is ready to listen. Recent years, Polly Murray has gotten her due. Books written, childhood home designated an historic landmark, residential college at Yale, which, where she was the first woman, I'm sorry, first African American to get a, uh, a JD, and named in the Episcopal Church, uh, or sainted by the Episcopal Church. If I had one local woman, Dorothy Height. She was born in Virginia, but rank and raised. Considered, we, we own Pittsburgh and her, I guess, in that sense. President Obama called her, right here you see, um, the godmother of the civil rights movement, who fought to make our nation a more open and inclusive place. Dorothy Height made her work through two major organizations, the YWA, YWCA, which I would argue her personal mission was successful in creating every Y as an integrated Y. Pittsburgh being either the first or second largely out of honor to her. And then the National Council of Negro Women. She was asked by US presidents to serve on commissions. She was asked by Lyndon Johnson in 1968 for her insight in the wake of the assassination to Dr. King to give some, some advice there. Without doubt, she is a great woman that we should know more about. But let's switch then to the mothers of the movement. We certainly would say Rosa Parks, I would call as a mother than godmother. Joanne Robinson, Daisy Bates of the Little Rock Nine. But to focus on one, Fannie Lou Hamer. Now as mentioned, some of you have heard the name. She, like Polly Murray, had a difficult childhood. Raised in poverty, went hungry often. Uh, because they had no mother, money for shoes, her mother would tie sacks onto their feet when as a child she's picking cotton in the fields. Polio left her with a limp, uh, limp in her, uh, and hip pain for her life. She loved children, hoped to have them, but had a, a number of miscarriages. And in 1961, she went, underwent surgery for what would be the removal of a small benign uterine tumor. The white doctor, without consulting her, chose to sterilize her. A common not on practice for African-American women at the time and some other women. She confronted the doctor for violating her body. She lived in an unpainted frame shack and earned less than $4 a day. And when about a year after that forced sterilization, the movement came to her door, she was ready for it. They called a meeting and asking for people willing to challenge voting discrimination. Who would be willing to register to vote? Her hand goes straight up. And her answer was simple. The only thing they could do was kill me. And it seemed like they'd been trying to do that a little bit at a time ever since I could remember. When she went to the registrar, she failed to properly interpret section 16 of the Mississippi State Constitution. When she went home, her boss told her, you remove your name from the request to register to vote or I will kick you off my land. She chose to keep her name on. She and her husband were kicked off the land, found temporary housing with a friend. Whites shot, whites shot bullets into that house. She and her husband got another cheap abode, gunfire into that house. And then they were given a $9,000 water bill. They had no indoor plumbing. She was continually challenged for her strength. To a degree, SNCC and the movement saved her life. She is most known for her beautiful singing voice. 
Henry Kirksey, one of the great early black elected officials, said Fannie Lou had the ability to get people worked up much more than Martin Luther King. Eleanor Holmes Norton concurred. She was an unbelievably brilliant orator and conceptualizer. You never heard a room flying like one that Fannie Lou set afire. Sunday, June 9th, 1963, about two, two plus days before Medgar Evers was assassinated, Fannie Lou Hamer and a few other women were coming back from a citizenship training seminar with Septima Clark. And on the bus ride, they talked about what they had learned and they wanted to put it into action. So at one of the bus stops, they got off and attempted to sit in a whites-only section. The driver eyes them up. For the next couple of stops, he went to the phone a couple of times. So they get to another stop, Winona, and they went and attempted to do the same. Police were there. They were arrested, dragged into the police station. One of the women, a 15-year-old girl, was taken out of the jail cell first, fully stripped and brutalized. A second woman was dragged out, beaten. And then they discovered who they had, Fannie Lou Hamer. They grabbed her, brought her out, and with a blackjack, which is a metal rod wrapped in leather, took a black prisoner and made him beat her as another black prisoner sat on her legs as she's face down on this table. The white officer pulled her dress up over her head as they beat and beat and beat her. None of those women received medical care. Fortunately, their allies who were waiting for them to return discovered they were missing and retrieved them before their death. A few, we a few weeks into April of 1944 was the birth of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Fannie Lou Hamer was chosen as one of the people, not eligible to vote, but eligible to run. She would challenge a sitting member of Congress, a guy who had been there since 1941. She also trained student volunteers for Freedom Summer, both in Oxford, Ohio, and in the South. And in her most famous moment, in Atlantic City, at the Democratic National Convention, though not aired live, she offer, offers the statement that she is most known for. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party came to seat black Mississippians. The president and some leaders of the NAACP agreed to have two representatives. And Lou Hamer felt, we want full representation. This is not a three-fifths clause, this is a full-fifths clause. The great black leader of the uh, NAACP called Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, you need a Blackwell, quote, ignorant about politics. In an eight minute speech that still resounds, she described taking the beating in jail and then finishes with these lines. All of this is on account of we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily? Because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Really nothing more can be said than that. But we end her life there. She went on to be an early opponent of the war in Vietnam. In 1968, she was credentialed. On the right, you see her speaking at the Democratic Convention. And she died poor because she gave most, uh, away most of the money that she earned. The daughter I want to focus on is Diane Nash. Diane Nash grew up in a middle class family in Chicago and though aware of racism, never really found cause to challenge it. She went to college at Howard University and again, in a sort of privileged university setting, didn't have much cause to question this, this system. But she chose to transfer and spend time at Fisk University in Nashville. Now while Nashville was known as a very progressive city, and in fact allowed integrated settings in many places, still had systemic limits there. And it's there where her racial consciousness emerged. In 1959, before the Greensboro sit-ins, Diane Nash was taking trainings with Jim Lawson the great advocate of Gandhian nonviolence and the trainer extraordinaire of youth in America. Upon that first arrest, Diane Nash led the move for, quote, jail no bail 
and told the, the judge that over a dozen students refused bail. We feel that if we pay these fines, we would be contributing to and supporting injustice and immoral practices that has been performed. They make this agreement with Mayor Ben West that they will leave jail if he creates this biracial committee that will address the problems of segregation. So they leave jail. Diane Nash, a little bit young, a little bit antsy, takes a few other kids and they go and they sit in in the white uh, restaurant area of the Greyhound bus station. Clever because that part was not part of the agreement they made with Ben West and they were served. That biracial committee started to collapse and then one of the student lawyer's homes was bombed. And Nash decided, that's it, that's the end. And so they have this major rally and demonstration. And you can see here that she addresses Mayor Ben West in the middle lower slide here. And her comment to him, her question to him, do you feel it is wrong to discriminate against a person solely on the basis of their race or color? She asked him, as he recalled, as a man, not as a politician. And he agreed it was wrong. As you can see in the upper picture to the right, John Lewis said of Nash, quote, she was the most daring of our leaders and was a devout, beautiful leader, but she was the wrong sex. There was a desire to emphasize and showcase black manhood. Diane Nash should have been the leader of SNCC, but Marion Barry was chosen to be the first leader. And I found it fascinating that other black women agreed with this. Black men had legally and physically been so emasculated that black women often, not always, felt that we had to let our black male brethren take this leadership. And I can't fully wrap my mind around that, but I can be sympathetic enough to accept that tragic argument. The Freedom Rides came. James Farmer, prime organizer, discovered that his father had died, so he had to leave. Was worried that the Freedom Rides would die. Diane Nash said, can we take over? Farmer warned her that it could be de deadly. She replied, we realize that. We're not stupid. But we can't let them stop us with violence. If we do that, the movement is dead. So she becomes the de facto leader of the Freedom Rides. I'm not interested now in people who call for gradualism. The answer, it seems to me, is to stop sinning and stop now. How long must we wait? Freedom is worth the price you have to pay. And all of us are willing to pay. The Justice Department in New Orleans got in contact with her, and the representative there said it was like talking to a wall. She wouldn't budge. She lobbied Dr. King to join the Freedom Rides. He refused and got a little bit irritated with her attempts to shame him. She spoke directly with Bobby Kennedy, frankly with Bobby Kennedy, who felt the Freedom Rides were unwise. She got very nervous at this point. She was worried the Kennedys were gonna take over the movement and co-opt it. Nash had a fissure with SNCC's male leadership. They wanted to push afterwards for the voting rights campaign. She felt direct action is the way to go. She was gonna leave SNCC until a meeting again at that beautiful Highlander school. Ella Baker intervened and kept Diane Nash in SNCC. And according to almost everybody, save SNCC. In 1962, she, with her husband, James Bevel, coordinated Move On Mississippi, the campaign of high school and college kids in Mississippi. She was arrested and convicted of contributing to the delinquency of minors for teaching nonviolent activism. At her trial, she was six months pregnant, facing a two and a half year sentence. Would she accept the plea? Would she stay firm? She prayed, she meditated, and she wrote an open letter. I have reached the conclusion that I can no longer cooperate with the evil and unjust court system of this state. I subscribe to the philosophy of nonviolence. This is one of the basic tenets of nonviolence, that you refuse to cooperate with evil. The southern courts in which we are being tried are completely corrupt. The real reason we are arrested is that we are opposing segregation, but the courts are not honest enough to state this frankly and charge us with this. My child will be a black child born in Mississippi, and thus wherever he is born, he will be in prison. 
I believe that if I go to jail now, it may help hasten that day when my child and all children will be free, not only on the day of their birth, but for all of their lives. A judge would suspend her sentence. Recently, in an interview with The Guardian, Ella, uh, I'm sorry, Diane Nash said the whole time she was scared. But here's the one thing. You had to do what was required, or you had to tolerate segregation. And whenever I obeyed a segregation law, I felt like I was agreeing that I was too inferior to do what the general population did. And she further said that nonviolent protest was the most important invention of the 20th century. My final group of women I call allied sisters, white women, and the beloved community. In teaching circles, the most famous white woman is Viola Liuzzo. And we understand why. She was the only white woman murdered in the movement. A mother who came down for Selma was ferrying activists back and forth and seen in the car with a black man. He survived, but she was killed. I respect our admiration for her suffering, but I do think that we lean to elevate death above dedication and we almost make a, a tokenism uh, out of uh, the one white woman who died. Instead, I'd like to highlight some women that I discovered in 2011. I took a group of 60 or 70 kids to the Heinz History Center for the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides and I met a beautiful young woman, well, <laughs> she was young then, she was in 2011, not so young, Joan Browning. She told me about the book deep in our hearts here. Each of the nine women in this book write their own story. As the foreword says, profound sense of pride and continued commitment to the values they embraced. Every entry reveals this mix of courage and self-doubt. They were all drawn to the movement for various reasons. Teresa Del Pozo rebelled against Italian sexism and working class limits. Sue Trasher was invited by a teacher that she respected and didn't want to let him down. Others joined because their boyfriends were involved. Joan Browning stumbled into it by wanting to find a rich religious experience. All spoke about the movement's lifelong influence on their lives. Almost everyone cited Ella Baker as one of their heroes. Most described finding what they, they called the beloved community. Many members were uh, part of the National Student Association in the 40s and 50s. So if anyone is here who participated in our great uh, student government workshop, maybe someday you'll be in a book like this. If I can share with you first a name not on this list, but one I adore, Anne and her husband Carl Braden, Louisville. Anne Braden found her voice as a Southern white woman after following the advice of an African-American founder of a radical group called the Civil Rights Congress. His name was William Patterson. He told her this, you don't have to be part of the world of the lynchers. You can join the other America, the people who struggled against slavery, the white people who supported them, the people who all through Reconstruction struggled. And then he just proceeded to describe white people who resisted the privilege of their race. She said, I was hardly dry behind the ears, and that's what I needed to hear. And so she cast her lot with the other America. In 1954, she and her husband helped this black family, the Wade family in the, upper, in, in the upper right, purchase a home. When whites in the neighborhood realized that a black family had moved in, they burned a cross on the Wade's front lawn. They then ostracized uh, the Braden family. They lost their jobs, and they become direct participants in the movement. Anne would become a confident and supporter of Septima Clark. In 1958, she wrote the book called The Wall Between. This is one of the few books of its time to unpack the psychology of white Southern racism from within. In 72, she wrote a letter to Southern white women, which was asking them, as my white sisters, you belong in the fight. We're the only ones who can destroy the myth of white Southern womanhood. And as late as 2002, she was still an activist in Louisville. Constance Curry, Con uh, Connie or Constance Curry and Casey Hayden. 
Connie Curry was the daughter of Irish immigrants and spent most of her early years in Greensboro, North Carolina. She was a student at Atlanta in 1953 and again got involved in National Student Association, student government. That's how she got involved in things. She started to participate in some UN activity with students, et cetera, et cetera. And then she, she attended the founding gathering of SNCC and became dear friends with Ella Baker. And they're chosen by the young kids as to be the adult leaders. Now, Connie Curry was 27 as the adult leader of 21-year-olds. She was the only white woman to serve on SNCC's executive committee and found that her role was mothering to a college kids. Casey Hayden, you might recognize the surname. Casey Hayden's mom was the only single mom in her town in, in Texas, so she grew up different. Then she was the only liberal who attended the University of Texas when she was there, so she's a castaway already. And through a student group at Texas, she found the movement. Connie Curry specifically helped her find it. Casey Hayden was a founding member of SNCC and Students for a Democratic Society. She was married briefly to Tom Hayden. She worked for Ella Baker on a southern wide movement to get uh, the YWCA to be activists there. She worked on literacy efforts in Tougaloo, Freedom Summer of 64. And in 65, she co-wrote, there were three authors, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee position paper, Women in the Movement. It became a time where SNCC was fissuring, and it was one of her most difficult times there. Penny Patch. She was a student at a school called Swarthmore who met SNCC organizers. And without asking for permission, I'm not encouraging this, kids, but without asking for, for permission, this 18-year-old became the first white woman working in a SNCC field project in the Deep South in 1962. She argued this. Being a bystander was simply not an option. In 2003, she wrote, my three years in the movement were utterly defining and profoundly affected everything I have done since. For the last 30 years, she's been involved in uh, being a midwife and, and women's health care in Vermont. Joan Brownie on the right, the woman I met. I remember in her talk discussing growing up in rural, uh, rural Georgia and seeing but not fully grasping the idea that their state fairs had a week for whites and then black days only. Seeing signs that said, we serve colored but carry out only. Water fountains chilled for whites, not chilled for African Americans. She went from picking hundreds of pounds of cottons a day to the rare chance to be the first in her family to attend college. She's got a scholarship, a lot at stake. Her first demonstration was with 13 people, led by James Lawson. She then was seeking a new spiritual direction, and she attended services at an African-American church. Her school told her, that's illegal. You will stop doing that, or you will lose your scholarship. She lost her scholarship. She became, in her words, quote, racially homeless because her family rejected her. As a southerner in the movement, she felt she was particularly mar uh, marked to be saved. She cites Ella Baker, Constance Curry, and Casey Hayden as influencing forces of her life. She participated with SNCC in 61 and then was involved in a freedom ride. Now, Freedom Rides had an intentional effort to try and have a balance between white and black participants. Four whites, four blacks, six whites, six blacks, et cetera. So there was one white person needed. And um, Casey Hayden and Bill Humphreys wanted that spot. But both knew they would lose their job, or for Bill Humphreys, his, um, uh, he's a graduate student, his fellowship. So they were hesitant. So Joan Browning stepped up. She suffered for the eight days that she spent in jail. Her parents refused to allow her to come home for Christmas. Her brother Wayne said, we wrote you out of the family. 
After being released from prison, she gave what she calls her only speaking moment of the movement. There's a rally that people cheer her, and this is her line. First time I've ever been in jail. It's funny, mixed up feeling, to hate being in a dirty place, but glad you're there for a good reason. We hope you all keep going. And she remembers that moment of the, as the definition of the beloved community. My race didn't seem a problem here. For me, the freedom movement was the all-inclusive true church. She describes that ever since participating in the movement, she's refused to cut corners. She ends her chapter, I write here because those of us who use the movement as a model for current social justice efforts need to know that the movement was not something imported in the briefcases of a few leaders, but was an ongoing living process involving thousands of people. Although most of the people were black, some were white. Many were women, most were southerners. As for me, I remain all three. In every place I go, I still try to stand as witness to the eternal principle that all men are created equal. In this sense, I'm still engaged in the freedom movement. And in response to a, a high schooler who emailed her in 2002, asking her, um, what would you tell others who seek to change unfair laws and attitudes? She gave this response. And I think back that, uh, to just a, a few days ago on February the 20th when I took 56 students to see Whose Streets, the story, or one story, one perspective of the Ferguson events of uh, three and a half years ago. And here we sat in an odd setting for Mount Lebanon students in a 60% African American theater. And, and our kids were so impressive. And then as Thomas Cosentino said, we just needed to listen to the talk back session. But I also thought about Grace McGrady, who said, we just simply wanted them to know that we support them. And I think that's what these women said. We can be allies. So let's end like we did last time. How should we remember the women of the movement? The first thing I hope you take away from tonight is to give women back their agency. They were leaders, strong leaders, independent leaders, creative leaders. Lynn Olson, a book that I would like to share with you, wrote this on page 151. Adlai Stevenson said to Smith's College 1955 graduating class, told them that they should focus their energy on, quote, the humble role of housewife. The assignment to you as wives and mothers, you can do in the living room with a baby in your lap or in the kitchen with a can opener in your hand. If you are a clever, if you are clever, maybe you can even practice your saving arts on that unsuspecting man while he's watching television. This from the leading liberal politician of the day. A few years later, Spelman College, an all-black college of women, its president, Benjamin May, says to them, above business politics and the professions, you Spelman women will be called upon to be wives, mothers, and home homemakers. The husband and father will make exacting demands of you, and he will expect certain things of you in spite of your education and degrees. These women had to buck that challenge there. We, be, we who believe in freedom shall not rest. But I think this for young women, the, stu the story of studying these women might have something bigger and greater. And for that, I'd like to share an exchange I had in email yesterday with Ann Matthews. I've had the great honor to teach all three Matthews girls, Kate, Meg, and Ann, and get to know them in clubs and activities. Anne and A-Push, for her culminating project, chose, like her older sisters, to take on the daunting research paper. Inspired by stories from her sister about Rosa Parks, Mahalia Jackson, and all these women I've talked about, Anne chose to write a piece called Forgotten Women in the Civil Rights Movement. Most kids procrastinate, but Anne did not. She read six book-length studies and 40 articles. And just like me over the past few months, felt overwhelmed with the amount of information and what to cut out. We met multiple times and it was exhilarating. Her passion, her interest, her exploration. It was a stellar project. But it was not simply an academic journey. 
The project influenced Anne personally and can be credited for lighting a passion and a sense of confidence in her. Above all student that year, Anne's self-assessment showed her per process in detail, but also its impact. The talk required a public speech, 15 minutes. Anne was an introverted kid, but something clicked that night. So in the email last night, she had wanted to come home from DC. She's at school in DC. Her mother made the proper decision that said, you have to attend class. She wrote, ever since I wrote my research paper for your class on forgotten women of the civil rights movement, I've had a strong passion for the subject. I still tell anyone who will listen about the impact women had on the movement and why we rarely talk about them today. I even gave her a presentation about them for one of my education classes. Uh, she's be preparing to become a health teacher. Um, and she thought that, you know, even though it's a health, this is one of the few opportunities I would have to teach about women of the movement and share my passion. In my presentation, I taught my class about Mahalia Jackson, Ella Baker, the true story of Rosa Parks, and why we don't remember the women of the movement. I got an A, and the, my professor said I gave her chills. I'm a very lucky man. My second thing I'd like you to remember is that the ideology of the women of the movement varied greatly. Some were deferential. Some were advocates of nonviolence, and some were militants. I was struck in all my research by their impeccable honesty and directness. I was saddened about the need to put their interests second and allow black men to go first at times. And I felt sorrow as the beloved community fractured into racial differences. Not clear cut as is sometimes remembered, but still clearly some fissures. Finally, I'd like to think of the limits of memory and the distortions of flawed or incomplete memories. Those students really said it well. If we can listen, maybe we can learn. So again, thank you for indulging me in my limited explanation of this most important topic and for your time tonight. Thank you. Okay, um, does anyone have any comments or questions? I can't, is there a hand? Yes, okay. Yes, Daisy Lamp. The name I know, but I have not, did not delve into her and did not research her. So it is another one of those other moments where the, I apologize. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. So it was asking about local women, Daisy, and her last name is spelled L E. L A M P K I N. L A M P K I N Lampkin. Okay. Uh, on the seventh. Yes. Yes. So there is a great. Um, uh, there is a, a talk at the library for four professional women, I think, um, with a moderator uh, talking. Is that the one we're talking about? No, we're talking about famous women in Western Pennsylvania. That's the eighth, though. That's the eighth. Okay, all right, great. We know that one, too. Right. Any other comments or questions? All right. All right, well, thank you very much for your time, folks. Have a good evening.